We've reached the second-to-last episode of Andor Season 1. This week was still enjoyable, it was still good, but it didn't quite live up to One Way Out for me, nor do I think it was meant to. Every episode can't be that level of amazing. And Episode 10 worked so well because Episodes 8 and 9 took their time building up the story elements and the tensions so that it could all come tumbling down. Episode 11 seems very similar to Episode 7. It's a bridge between stories. It takes time to set up all the pieces on the board, so I assume assume episode 12 can come along and pick up the board and throw it against the wall. I expect chaos next week, but let's get into some of the specifics of this week. I want to start with the death of Marva, which I was not expecting to happen this way. It's not like I'm surprised they built up to it over the past few episodes, but still, I didn't think it was going to happen off screen. People dying of old age is just not normal for Star Wars. I thought she would go down fighting, and instead it's just tragic, which is exactly the point. The entire scene is presented that way through B2 Emo's point of view, and I just can't stand seeing the little droid be so distraught. I'm glad Brasso winds up spending the night with him later on. But I suspect Marva's death will still be the spark of something big on Ferrix. Two episodes in a row have begun with a body being taken away. First Olaf, and now Marva. I was expecting Salmon Pax hanging to be the reason for the Ferrix uprising, and I still hope that hasn't happened and the citizens can stop it. But I think Marva's death will be more than simply a reason for Cassian to come home. And not just Cassian, but nearly every major character in this series. I love that little moment of Cinta and the ISB spy casually talking to one another, completely oblivious to the fact that they're waiting for the same person. Or maybe they do know, and they're just playing coy. At least the Imperial doesn't seem to realize Cinta is a spy because he doesn't report her to Dedra. Miro insists on letting the citizens hold a funeral, hoping that it will lure Cassian into her net. Meanwhile, Cassian is literally caught in a net that very moment. So let's catch up with him and Melshi on Narkina 5 as they continue to flee the prison. I was kind of expecting the series to skip over how they got off the planet, the same way we saw Cinta piloting a scooter on Aldani, and the next thing we know she's on Ferrix. But no, they want us to see that just because they got out of the prison, it doesn't mean they're home free. They have to hide on cliffs as Imperial patrols search for them, they have to find a ship, I like seeing Melshi's desperation. They escaped hell, and it was so cathartic in the moment, but that doesn't mean the struggle is over. It continues on. In Melshi's haste to steal a ship, he gets them both caught by two Narkinians. First, let me praise those creature designs. One of the biggest criticisms I've seen of this series is the lack of aliens. I would phrase it a little differently and just say Andor isn't as pulpy as Star Wars tends to be. Those moments have been few and far between, but when they do happen, like with Dr. Quadpaw, they have been good. One of the Narkinians literally has knives for hands, and the other one talks like Mizey My, Toozy Too. I enjoyed the pulpiness of their scene. For a second, it sounds like the two Narkinians are considering turning Cassian and Melshi back over to the Empire for a reward, but they explain that the prisons have poisoned the water of their planet and killed their fish, so they're happier to help the prisoners. The Empire always thinks it can brute force its way through any situation and any community, and they often can. They think they can take over Narkina 5, and even if people escape, the locals will turn them over for a little money. They probably think they've isolated the planet well enough. Like Zori Bliss says, the First Order, or in this case, the Empire, wins by making you think you're alone. The Empire fears community and communication. That's why they panicked and tried to stop communication within the prison, but it was too late. But all of their efforts to separate people and cultures wind up having the opposite effect. Cassian and Melshi and the Narkinians have very little in common, except for the fact that they have both felt the boot of the Empire, and that gives them a connection and a sense of community. And that's what the Rebel Alliance is eventually. It's all of these disparate people who were once isolated coming together against their common enemy. Unfortunately, the Rebellion isn't there yet. Luthen seems to be its chief architect at this point, and he also has a fear of too much communication. He is afraid the Empire will discover him, so he keeps everything close to his chest. Everything is a secret.
concert with him, Vel, who got him 80 million credits, isn't able to meet with him face to face, and then Clea tells her she is just one of many needy, panicked faces. But these rebels don't have to feel panicked. They could feel organized. They could feel trust. Luthen's methods can be effective to a degree, but as we see later with Saw and the Partisans, they mostly lead to distrust and paranoia. I loved that scene. Forrest Whitaker's performance in Rogue One was way more unhinged than I expected. Andor is showing us how and why he got to be that way, and I totally get it now. Luthen dumps a lot onto him. He basically gives Saw the choice to let Krieger live or die, I guess so he can wash his hands of it. But the interaction also shows Saw that he is just a pawn in Luthen's game. That Saw and his men might be sacrificed at some point just to keep some secret source safe. And he starts to think that someone in his group might be reporting back to Luthen. And he's probably right. He is right to be paranoid, because like I said, Luthen is not creating an alliance. He is not creating a community of people that value one another. He's just using people. Of course that sends Saw into a paranoid spiral, and the whole time Luthen tells Saw he's avoiding the choice of letting Krieger live or die. No, you're avoiding the choice, Luthen. You're just trying to spread the weight of the guilt around. I think we're seeing that Vel is over Luthen's way of doing things. She tells Clea about Cassian's funeral and then heads to Mon Mothma's, where they watch Lita and some other girls in some traditional Chandrillan gathering. Mon has lost her taste for those traditions as she got older, but Lita is rebelling against that by sticking to them. I can see where she's coming from, living in the heart of the Empire with little connection back to her real home. Mothma even says the traditions are more strongly felt on Coruscant than Chandrilla. It makes Davos Golden's potential marriage proposal with his son even more complicated because Lita would probably be open to it. It's not like Mon would be forcing her daughter into anything, but she knows where that path leads. She is thinking about her daughter in the long term. That's another difference I see between her and Luthen. I don't think he sees the long term picture. He has been planning his rebellion for 15 years, so he's definitely a planner, but all he's thinking about is bringing down the Empire. I don't think he has any thoughts beyond that. Like he said, he doesn't expect to see the sunrise that follows. But Mothma knows it's not enough to just win. She plans to see that sunrise, and she wants to have her soul intact by the end of the fight. Deciding whether or not to accept Skulden's proposal is a big challenge to that philosophy. I think slash hope Vel is going to offer her a new way out of her financial troubles. Mothma explains the entire situation to her, and mentions Aldani and how that made everything worse. I don't know how much access Vel has to all that money, but come on, they can spare 400,000 credits. I think Luthen would even give her the money if he knew what was going on, just to keep eyes off of him. But he doesn't know what trouble Mothma is in. Mothma doesn't know for sure that he pulled off Aldani, and she definitely doesn't know Vel was involved. Again, there is no trust there, and if there were, problems could be solved. But the reason I think Vel is starting to be tired of Luthen is because she says his name multiple times in this one scene. Before now, she has been very insistent that his name is never uttered, even with Mon. Now she's throwing it around willy-nilly. I could see her going behind Luthen's back to save her niece's future and her cousin from making a terrible decision. Speaking of terrible decisions, let's catch up with Cyril Karn, who gets a late-night call from Mosk. He caught wind of Marva's death and upcoming funeral and passed along the news. And of course, Karn hasn't stopped thinking about Cassian this entire time, so he is all too ready to head back to Ferrix in the hopes that he might show up. And who else is heading there? Luthen. I really enjoyed his coded message to Clea. I also liked the action scene with the Arrestor Cruiser. I wish it hadn't been largely shown in the trailers, though. It would have been more satisfying to not know the Fondor was full of surprises. I'm also kind of struggling to figure out why this scene was included. Like, it mostly felt like a pacing issue, or like, we need to have some action in this episode, so they put in this sequence. But I feel like the payoff will be in episode 12. The Empire seeing the Fondor could spell trouble 
trouble for Luthen. And it's not just the Empire that spells trouble, but it's also Cyril. Assuming Luthen does head back to Ferrix to wait for Cassian, Cyril Karn is the one person who can identify him. The scene between Bix and the ISB reminds us that they have no idea who Axis is or what he looks like, but Cyril told Dedra that he would recognize his voice. That's gonna come back, and I think it's kind of perfect that Luthen could potentially be caught because he told Cassian to kill someone. For all his planning and plotting and all the lengths he goes through to keep his identity safe, he's gonna get caught because he throws lives away without a thought. Luthen doesn't remember Cyril Karn, the axe forgets, but the tree remembers. I'm also curious about what's going to happen to Cyril. Dedra has warned him that if she sees him again, things wouldn't go well. But if he delivers access to the Empire, that might change things. Or it could add more friction between them. I could kind of see him proudly bringing Luthen to her, thinking he'll be welcomed into the Empire with open arms, and then she just shoots him or something so he doesn't steal her thunder. I have no idea what's going to happen, and I love that. Luthen, Cyril, Cinta, Vel, and Dedra are all going to Ferrix to wait for Cassie and Andor to come home. I might not know how the season will end, but I think it's safe to say that things are about to get chaotic. The episode ends with Cassian contacting his home and learning that Marva has passed away. The last thing he wanted to tell her is that she would have been proud of him for what he did on Narkina 5, but she'll never know how their final meeting affected him. I'm a little bummed Melshi isn't sticking around with Cassian, but I get it. There are enough people going to Ferrix, and Melshi is right. Someone needs to make sure the galaxy knows what's happening in the prisons, and the two of them might be the only hope of that happening. That's why the series didn't gloss over the rest of their escape, because we needed to see that it wasn't easy, that it was desperate. The prisoners of Narkina 5 may have hurt the Empire, but it's not a victory unless they spread the word. This isn't Aldani. No one is going to share the news for them. I think we can safely assume Melshi will take care of that because Cassie and Andor has to go home. I think it's fitting that for all of this episode's exploration of community that we will end back where we started with Cassian's community. Let's keep this personal. The stakes don't have to be on the galactic scale. It can just be about this one neighborhood on this one planet. And if it's anything like watching the prison escape, it'll still feel great to watch it all unfold. I love that the episode ends with Cassian looking out over the beach with the sun starting to peek through the clouds. It's a direct parallel to his final moments on Scarif, but his story isn't ending, it's beginning. This entire season, we have watched people change him. Luthen, Nimic, Skeen, Marva, Kino, and more. He has been taught everything he needs to be a rebel again, because we saw that he once was in the flashbacks on Canari and on Ferrix. The death of his father and his inability to do anything about it probably killed his spirit for a while, but it's back now, and I can't wait to see what he does. On the beaches of Scarif we see his death, but on the beaches of Niamos, I think we're finally seeing the birth of a rebel. But that's all I've got to say for now. Let me know what you thought of the episode in the comments, and come back at 6 p.m. Eastern to join our our live after show, no ifs, and or buts, to talk about everything I didn't cover here. If you haven't already, please like this video, subscribe to the channel for all our Andor coverage, follow us on TikTok, Twitter, and Instagram, and consider checking out our Patreon page for our video reactions and audio commentaries for every new episode. And you can check out this playlist for all of our existing Andor content. As always, thanks for watching, and may the Force be with you.